Um, hello, Slush. It was an absolute privilege to return to Helsinki. And I don't know about you, I've been so terribly inspired by everything I've seen today on this stage. And I can't wait to see who's going to win the pitching competition. Uh, before we do that, let me talk to you about net zero. And let's have a bit of a show of hands. Who in the audience knows what net zero actually means? We've all heard about it, but what does it actually mean? Yeah, I see some hands, but in a world where um, you know temperatures are rising and we're all trying to reduce emissions and get to a place where we no longer pollute as much as we used to, probably we should all be getting a bit of a better understanding of what net zero is and what we need to achieve it. So net zero is a state at which we're no longer adding more carbon to the atmosphere. So if you look at this graph, what you're going to see here is basically this is all of the incredible and very important carbon reduction activity. So I'm sure you would have heard of all the big corporates as well as countries talking about how they're going to reduce their emissions. And it's probably the most important thing we can be doing. The best way to have less carbon in the atmosphere is to stop putting it there. Now the challenge is twofold. One, uh, not all the emissions can be fully abated. I mean, we can all be investing in solar, in alternative plastics, in hydrogen, in fusion, but there will always be that bit that just cannot be abated. And in some industries, it's going to be 10%, and in some, like in aviation, it might be up to a third of all emissions, but there is that bit that cannot be abated. And the only way to neutralize those emissions is by... Uh, oh. There we go, we're back, is by durably removing them. And this is carbon removal rather than a carbon offset. So I'm sure that many of you have heard about um, carbon credits. Often these are credits that pay for protecting forests from being chopped down or paying for cookstove projects or moving to solar. A lot of it is really good climate action, some of it not so much. But what I work on here at Curate is carbon removal. So the different ways in which we can sequester carbon from the atmosphere. And why is that incredibly, incredibly important? is because, unfortunately, we already left it too late. It's not only that we cannot abate some of our, our ongoing emissions, it's also that some of the emissions that are already up in the atmosphere, the accumulation of them is too much. So we have to remove carbon from the atmosphere at a completely unprecedented speed. And to give you a sense of the problem, we currently, on this Earth, emit about 40 gigatons, 40 billion tons of carbon. Um, we are going to have to, each year, remove 10 gigatons of carbon. Now, these are all huge amounts. It's very hard to visualize it. So think about atmospheric balloons. Think of a balloon that has 10 meters in diameter and now fill it up with CO2. If we wanted to visualize 40 gigatons of emissions, that would stretch from the Earth to the Moon 10 times there and back, or it would cover the surface of the planet 11 times. So we're emitting 40 gigatons of carbon. We need to be removing 10 gigatons per year. We're really at the very beginning of this ecosystem. It's less than five years old. Good news is we've got a lot of the science. Some of the most incredible PhDs on this planet are working on carbon removal, but we need to build an ecosystem around it. And we at Curate call it the space race of the 21st industry. We need to, uh, 20, yeah, 21st century. We need to uh, build an industry that's uh, bigger than oil and gas in the next 20 years. So what are these different ways in which we can remove carbon? There are many, and they're all fascinating, and they're going to add up to a trillion dollar industry that's going to be driven by regulation. Today, it's a completely voluntary market. About three billion dollars to date has been spent on carbon removal, a lot of that driven by Microsoft. But uh, it is going to be a trillion dollar industry, and we need all of the different pathways and ways of removing carbon to adapt to that number. So let me tell you a few really, really cool stories. And I don't know about you, I am not a chemist or a physicist, but some of these things really felt like touching the iPhone for the very first time. So let's, let's talk about enhanced rock weathering. It's a naturally occurring process where you take silicate rock, for instance, basalt, and you um, normally what would happen is over very many years, thousands of years, it would weather and it would yield to carbon sequestration 
concentration, and then that carbon would flow into the oceans and sit at the bottom of the oceans for a very long time. But we can speed up that naturally occurring process. We can take basalt rock, we can grind it really finely, and we can spread it on fields. And not only will that speed up sequestration of carbon, in many places it will also increase the yields of crops. And for instance, there have been fantastic studies in Kenya where we can increase the yield of crops as much as three times. So we have additional benefits besides removing carbon. We can talk about direct air capture. I'm sure many of you have heard about these fantastical sky hoovers that suck in the air and separate mechanically or um, chemically the CO2, and then they put it deep into geological storage where it mineralizes and it stays there forever. It's really cool. I went to Iceland last year and I held two pieces of rock in both hands and one was fresh porous rock and the other one was injected with CO2. It was really some of the best human ingenuity and uh, working with nature. And obviously, I'm sure you've heard about, for instance, tree planting. It is very important. There are different ways in which we can manage land. It's not only about uh, planting native species. It's also making sure that the land is managed in such a way that the forest is not going to get chopped down sooner than, say, 100 years. Um, we can burn biochar, uh, which is this very carbon-rich charcoal that um, burns biomass in low oxygen environments. And again, that can be used as fertilizer. And blue carbon is probably, um, I try and not have faith but it might be one of my favorites because the, the ocean is the largest carbon sink that we have. And when you think about different ways in which we can use it to store additional carbon, it's really fascinating. So uh, where does Curate come into all of this? So we call ourselves market makers on a mission to facilitate a billion tons of carbon removed every year. So 10% of what we need to be removing as a species each year. Um, we are a team of 22 based in London. We have some of the world's best PhDs working on the chemistry, on the physics, as well as building software and AI to help speed up the due diligence of when we source credits and then how to manage the credits after they have been purchased. This industry is entirely in the future. 94% of all carbon removal credits that are being bought right now are only going to deliver carbon removal over the many years. So we need to be buying the best possible credits today, supporting corporates to take the right decisions, supporting banks to finance it. I don't know how many of you work in hardware, but you know how important it is to have the appropriate capital stack. Quite often, these projects right now are relying on VC capital and hello VCs in the room, thank you for your money, but you alone will not be able to build this industry. So we also need new innovative ways to finance what we call folk or first of a kind financing of new projects. We've been doing this about two years. We have worked with some of the world's biggest brands. My co-founder, Dr. Gabriel Walker, is a preeminent climate scientist. She used to teach at Cambridge and Princeton. She used to be the climate change editor of Nature magazine, and she's done um, a TED talk on carbon removal that had six million views, and I really recommend it if you want to dig more into carbon removal. Uh, we've done the UK's largest carbon removal offtake for British Airways, and we've partnered with some really cool events like Royal Ascot or London Marathon, or we've put on the world's first carbon removal concerts to show people and educate people and educate leaders on the importance of carbon removal as a new asset class and the fact that we need to be investing in carbon removal. And if all of that wasn't complex enough, we then came up with a new problem. So we're managing to sell this stuff, we're putting portfolios, we're selling those. But then what happens is when people start spending billions of dollars on something, on a new asset class, then they generally want to know where their money went. So, as I said earlier, three billion, but basically most of those credits are currently being held in spreadsheets. And I'm a huge fan of a good spreadsheet, but when you're a CSO, Chief Sustainability Officer, and you go to the CFO and you say, hi, can I please have millions and millions and millions of dollars to spend on this in order to fulfill our compliance requirements and to be able to operate in the zero world, then generally the CFO would want to know where the money, where the money went. So managing what in effect is a carbon balance sheet and 
managing delivery risk. I bought this stuff. I commit to pay for it. Is it going to get delivered? Accounting, compliance, and reporting is really complex. Communicating internally and externally beyond just doing a report once a year. And then justification of future budgets. How do I know that I spent my money correctly so that when I go and ask for more money to buy more carbon removal? And these are huge budgets. British Airways, for instance, emits 18 million tons of carbon uh, a year. Up to a third of that is going to have to be removed per year. We're talking six million at the average price point of $200. You can see for yourself the kinds of challenges that these brands are facing and the kinds of budgets that they have. So we built a tool that I want to show you today that's going to visualize a little bit of what it looks like once you've purchased carbon removal and how you can hold it for primary, uh, for primary reasons to then um, retire against your net zero, or you could also be reselling it on to the secondary market that is emerging. So now let's see if this plays. The demo effect I was trying to avoid. Ta-da. All right, there you go. So you are a sustainability professional working in a corporate, and this is your carbon removal portfolio. You've bought some soil carbon, some afforestation, some biochar, some biomass with carbon removal and storage, direct air capture, and enhanced rock weathering. This is the total tons that you've committed to purchase. How many got delivered already? Again, some of these projects deliver over very many years. You look at the value of your whole portfolio, as well as the fact that it's increasing in price because prices are going up, so you want to make the argument that you spent your money wisely. And you can look into the different projects that are in your portfolio, as well as a little bit of the characteristics of the portfolio, so the durability, the types of a solution, and the speed with which it's removing carbon. Some remove carbon straight away. Some take many years to remove carbon. It also tells you a little bit of the story for your ESG reporting on what SDGs you are delivering on. So then if we look at one of the credits to give you a sense of um, what um, some data on the, credit, uh, on the project would look like. So we've got a project overview. The majority of our IP at Curate sits in the due diligence of projects. So we've got a bit of a summary of our quality report, a little bit of imagery that really speaks to the imagination of people that are partying with millions of dollars uh, each year. It tells you about the issuance performance. So if any of you have seen, a, say, a wealth management platform or a stocks platform, we'll give you a sense of also what you've been investing in and when, and also how these credits move through the life cycle. So from the point they got purchased, then they got um, retired uh, at the end when, after they got delivered. And it tells you a little bit about our quality assessment. We look at over 200 data points across five categories, uh, which is impact integrity beyond carbon and delivery risk. So you can see exactly what it is that you've been investing in. So beyond that, uh, you can also see how the credits are delivering over a longer period of time. Imagine that you're trying to claim uh, net zero in 2030. You need to be thinking about what is the proportion of carbon removal that you need to be buying and how much of that is going to get delivered at which point. And also, when you overlay this with delivery risks, and some credits are going to underdeliver or deliver slower, then this helps you manage and ensure that you will be able to make that claim in the year in which you need to be doing it and avoid uh, getting compliance fines. And the last thing I wanted to show you today, ultimately the question is how much carbon should I be buying? Nobody today is buying the true 10% of what they're going to have to, as per regulation, be buying. But we're also building a tool that helps you estimate, based on your target year and your current annual emission, what is your carbon reduction profile, and in line with that, um, what you would have to be buying, and we're also recommending which projects you would be able to purchase within a given budget that would help you get those credits delivered at a point at which you need to be making the net zero claim. So, hope that's given you a little bit of uh, a view into the fascinating world of uh, net zero. And if net zero itself doesn't excite you, I really recommend that you look into carbon removal. It's really the thing that gives me hope. And again, my co-founder has been working on climate change for over 30 years now, and she always says that she apologizes to the room that she hasn't fixed it yet. She tells me that when she first heard of carbon removal, she felt hope. And those of us that work on climate change very rarely have that feeling. So I'd love to share with you my sense of hope. This is the space race of the 21st century. I'm Marta. We are Curate. Um, my details are over there. Thank you, Slash.